Well, first, have the demands of progressives been heard at the White House with the appointment of financial reform champion Elizabeth Warren? And more importantly, what will come of her brainchild, the Consumer Financial Protection Agency? Poverty stands at an official 14.3%, or one in seven of us, the highest number in 15 years. But the engines of profit on Wall Street are also bleating there in trouble. According to a front page New York Times alert, compensation and bonuses at the biggest banks may be down this year. Poor old Goldman only is expecting to earn some $7.8 billion. Will the richest voices remain the loudest in the debate over taxes and stimulus? We'll check in with Grit TV commentator on the economy, Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic Policy and Research, next. For years, financial companies have been able to spend millions of dollars on their own watchdog, lobbyists who look out for their interests and fight for their priorities. That's their right. But from now on, consumers will also have a powerful watchdog, a tough, independent watchdog whose job it is to stand up for their financial interests, for their family's future. And I'm proud that we got this done, and I'm equally proud that Elizabeth Warren will be helping uh, to make her original vision a reality. All right, Dean. Well, a lot of people watching this probably think that Elizabeth Warren has been appointed as our Consumer Financial Protection Agency head, just as a lot of people think that Don't Ask, Don't Tell has already been repealed. What was Warren actually appointed to uh, this Friday, announced right there by the president? And was this a smart move? What happened this week? Well, what President Obama did was he appointed her an advisor to both himself and Treasury Secretary Geithner for dealing with the Consumer Financial Products Protection Agency. And this is kind of a classic dodge because he didn't actually appoint her to chair the agency. And I should point out, he had the option to appoint her as an interim chair, not a recess appointment, an interim chair. This was in the law. And that she would sit in that position until Congress appointed a permanent chair. And he's free to, of course, nominate her. And if the Republicans or her opponents decide to filibuster, they'd be able to do so. And she'd remain as interim chair. Um, so he, he instead chose this halfway measure. And, you know, the one thing I'll say, I have great confidence in Elizabeth Warren. She's not going to sit there meekly. And if she doesn't feel that her recommendations in her advisory capacity are being taken seriously, I don't doubt she'll make a stink and, if necessary, leave. But it, it's something... I don't think we could rest assured that that agency is in the hands of Elizabeth Warren at this point. All right. Well, the other bit of news uh, coming from Washington was about the Senate passing that uh, small business tax cut bill. Anything to be excited about there? This is a show, you know, for the election. Uh, small business is apple pie. Everyone wants to say small businesses are great and, you know, they create 70 or 80 percent of whatever you want of new jobs. Of course, the reality is small businesses also lose 70 or 80 percent of new jobs. This is a big joke, you know, because basically most small businesses aren't around very long. So if we looked at who created jobs in 2010, yes, they were small businesses disproportionately and they were also the ones that lost jobs. <laughs> Anyhow, this bill will give more money to banks that ostensibly is supposed to get more credit flowing to small businesses. It's likely to have very, very little effect, but it's something to show before Election Day. All right. Well, I'm, I'm grasping here. Now, what about the continuing discussion about cutting taxes for the uh, middle class and allowing those on the super, super rich uh, to continue? You've still got a lot of people out there, out there this weekend, even once again, reiterating the notion that maybe those 250,000 and above earners aren't so wealthy, aren't the affluent. Yeah, you know, there, there have been some efforts, and they're, they're really kind of comical. It really says a great deal about the, the world that these people live in, because there have been people who, who say, that, well, I'm in that top 2%, and, you know, the idea that you could just raise my taxes and I won't feel it. Well, I, you know, and they go on about their expenses, and it, it's it, it's kind of laughable, because these are people earning four, five, six hundred thousand 600000 a year. This is incomes that are 10 times what most people in this country are living on. And they're trying to enlist the sympathy of the public at large because, you know, it's hard to pay the nanny and you have the vacation home that has to, you know, needs repairs and this and that. They're living in a whole different world, which I think most of us understood. But what's remarkable is that they think that they're going to get sympathy. Um, it's one thing to argue for these tax breaks by saying, look, this is good for the economy. And this is what most of the argument had been that, you know, the, this richest 2 percent, those are the ones that start their small businesses, that, you know, they need this money to make the businesses grow. I mean, the, what, that argument really doesn't hold water, as, you know, many others have argued. 
But the idea that we should have sympathy for these people, that, that's a little hard to imagine. But do you have any at all for those who are maybe in the $250,000 range and say, wait a minute, we shouldn't be taxed at the same rate as people who are raking in billions? Well, again, the important point to keep in mind is the marginal tax rate. So what that means is what you get taxed on at that higher rate is what's over 250000 And the Joint Tax Committee of Congress just did analysis of the impact uh, of President Obama's proposal. And if you take that group of people, 250000 to, to 500000 if you like, maybe you could still call those middle class. They're way better, than, way better off than most of the population. But okay, fine, call middle class. The average hit on that group is $500. So the idea that someone earning three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand a year is just going to be waylaid because their tax bill went fi- went up five hundred dollars, you know, ten bucks a week, this is a little hard to imagine. All right. Well, meanwhile, the census statistics on poverty are out, and we're looking at some forty-four million people in poverty. Here's one report, uh, not a terrible one, from CBS Evening News. I'd love your take on how this issue is covered. For once, we cover the poor people in this economy. But how do we do it? Take a look. Maria Chavez spent her Monday morning trying to find her family's dinner at the local food pantry. It's very sad. I cry sometimes because I don't want to come to here to get food. She's now unemployed, but a year and a half ago, she was cleaning houses and providing daycare. Her husband was in construction, and they had no problem feeding and clothing their kids. I was in the middle. I feel great because I said, oh, my God, I have money. I can pay my bills. I can buy my food. But thanks to the recession and slow recovery, the Chavez's and a growing number of American families are now slipping into poverty. How do you, what do you make of that report, and how do you think the statistics have been covered so far? Well, in the scheme of things, it actually wasn't a bad report. I mean, the one thing I think is unfortunate, perhaps, that they, they picked a apparently Hispanic family. And, of course, most poor people in this country are actually white. You know, and people are often confused about that. I mean, disproportionately, Latinos and, and African-Americans do experience poverty. But still, most poor people are disproportionate or most poor people are whites. But it actually it, it was good in the sense that it made the point that these were people were working and they're unemployed not because they're lazy or they don't have the skills or whatever. They're unemployed because of the bad economy. But the most, you know, what I find the discouraging aspect of this, you know, poverty is a one day event. You know, we had the report released and we talk about poverty, whereas every day of the week we're going to hear what the stock market did. And in terms of the reality for most people, the poverty story is the much more realistic, more important story. Not that most people are in poverty. Of course, they're not, thankfully, although a third of children are. But many people will at some point in their life experience poverty. Certainly many more people will experience poverty than will ever hit it rich in the stock market. So it, it's unfortunate. It's sort of this one-day event, and you know, I don't know if CBS News is going to talk about the plight of working people. Uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say for another year, but it might be quite some time. Then I've got to give you a chance to respond to what former President Clinton had to say about jobs. He says they're out there. People just have a skills mismatch. I'll meet the press. For the first time in my lifetime, David, we are coming out of recession with posted job openings. That is, tomorrow Monday, you could get that job. These jobs have been offered. They're going up twice as fast as job hires in this horrible economy. Why? Because of two things. First, over 10 million of our fellow citizens are living in homes that are worth less than their mortgages, so they can't move or their credit's ruined for life. We still need more efforts to fix that. And second, way the biggest problem, is there's a skills mismatch. The jobs that are being opened don't have qualified people applying for them. We need a system to immediately train them to move into that job. All right, we've got about 45 seconds. Dean, go for it. This is really pernicious. I mean, there, there's literally zero evidence for what President Clinton said. We have the data on job openings. There's about 3 million. There are about 15 million people that are unemployed. If his story were true, we would be able to point to the occupations, point to the industries, point to the parts of the country where jobs are going wanting, where we should see wages going through the roof. Workers are working long hours because employers can't find more workers. You cannot identify that industry. You can't identify that part of the country. This is an excuse for people in power not to do anything about an unemployment crisis that was created because of their incompetence. Dean Baker, thanks so very much. We're going to link to your previous appearances on our program right there at our website, grittv.org, and your work for CPR. Thanks so much for joining us. We're going to go out with this vision, this story from the Invisible People's Project. 
It's the inside tale of one person's homelessness. This comes from Seminole County, Florida. Diana's story. Well, it sure is uh, not easy to be out there, okay? You get no support, no nothing, especially when you're single with no kids. And if you want to get back on your feet, you have no chance. Because it takes money to get somewhere, either if it's with a bus or with gas. It's, um, it's impossible to get support on, on, on parts like that. Or phone, you need a phone to get job interviews. Uh, you have to have a computer, you have to have access to it. People have to be able to call you. I mean, there are so many things you can't get to get back up. And then when you finally get a job, like I just got a job, I can start tomorrow. I find out I'm homeless again on Saturday. So what's 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 the use? And, and I mean, right, it's, now, it's done. I mean. And right now you're in a uh, a hotel. Yeah, I was put down by a sharing center, which is a sharing center is incredible. They've been helping people. I mean, more than most places I have heard or seen. But it says they can only do so much. There's no funds. I mean, it's rather it goes to politicians like Christie for a $90,000 lunch. You know, it's like nice when you eat out of the garbage cans to hear that. Or uh, your walkway is getting built for $2 million. But what about the people which need the help and support to get back on their feet?